Hello to everybody. Uh, thank you to be here today. I have the pleasure to introduce you Dalibor Sirola, tennis performance specialist. Dalibor is an expert in strength conditioning and flywheel training. So thank you very much, Dalibor. Thank you, Marco, to invite me to, to share my, my knowledge and my experience. As you said, uh, uh, I'm a tennis performance specialist. Um, last 10 years of my career, I'm involved in a high level of tennis. I'm also founder of Sirola Training Systems and uh, head of performance at the Piatti Tennis Center, uh, one tennis academy in uh, Italy. Uh, also, I'm a Desmotec Academy member. Uh, Desmotec Academy is a community of professional experts, trainers, physiotherapists who work together with, uh, with Desmotec to improve this technology by giving uh, feedback and support to the company. So in this uh, brief presentation, I will share you my, my knowledge and my journey of how I discover flywheel training methodology and uh, which one are the main benefits and uh, advantages of using this ISO inertial training machines. So even if this uh, uh, training technology is uh, relatively new uh, on the market, first researchers are uh, way in the past, uh, are done way in the past. Uh, first one, as you can see, is done in 1924 and in the University of Copenhagen. The actual first machine is produced in the late 80s by the Swedish scientist. Uh, and uh, the, the first purpose of this training technology, uh, it was to help astronauts to maintain skeletal muscle and uh, muscle strength and muscle mass during the long voyages in the space. Uh, the term isoinertial comes from the two words, from the ISO, which means the same, and inertial, which means resistance. So this is the primary concept of this system. Uh, the same inertia in both concentric and eccentric phases of muscle contraction. Uh, also in ISO inertial training methodology, the resistance is adapted in every moment. So what that means? That means uh, that uh, force you produce in the concentric part of one exercise, and let's imagine a, a squat as an exercise. So you, you rise from the bottom of the squat, you go up. So this is concentric phase of the squat. So more you uh, force, uh, more force you produce during this concentric phase, the same force you will need to control in the eccentric phase of that moment. Then so when you go down again to the bottom of the squat. And this is what makes a huge difference from conventional type of exercising, whether you're using weights or cable system or something else. So um, on the next slide, I will, I will explain to you, uh, like I said, uh, what was my journey to came to this, to this uh, uh, solution of using uh, this kind of machine. So throughout my career, I have uh, many times I ask myself a question, uh, uh, what is actual transfer of classic strength training into the sport field? Or even better, how much strength is enough? So uh, I'm not arguing about uh, uh, the fact that we need strength training because more strength we have, more force we can apply against the ground. And then uh, as a consequence, we have potential to move faster off the ground. And this is, uh, this, this is uh, clear and, and I'm completely agree with that. But how much is enough? Or uh, because uh, we need to understand that too much strength training. And uh, I mean about that, it's uh, what I mean about that, it's heavy lifting can screw the co-contraction properties uh, of, of uh, proper muscle uh, fire sequencing. So uh, fast athletes in general, they need opposing inhibitory action of the muscles. Um, so uh, I, here I put two quotes, uh, maybe to, to explain me better. Uh, first one is from, from Dr. Greg Rose from Titles Performance Institute. 
and uh, who is saying efficiency is maximal power output with less amount of effort. Uh, based on that also uh, effort is built on inhibition, is, need, is not built on facilitation. This, this one is from, to, from Dr. Ron Hruska from Postal Restoration Institute. So if you look at these two quotes and two, and two of these definitions, and then we have a look of, on this athlete who is doing squatting with a trap bar. Uh, I'm not sure if we can apply these two definitions uh, of efficiency and effort uh, in the squat, which one he is doing with this heavy weight. So again, uh, I think really important uh, uh, concept, uh, too much strength training have impact uh, on our co-contraction properties and proper muscle firing. Uh, also, if in our regular uh, training periodization principles, uh, uh, if we make athletes stronger, then we need to transform this strength into the power and then ultimately into the speed and agility, as you can see on this graph here. So um, we have a um, uh, classic uh, absolute strength to absolute speed and agility continuum. And uh, more or less, this is our periodization for every kind of preparation period we have. So, uh, but another question, uh, but what if we don't have blocks of training long enough to go through all this cycle. So if, if we don't have time to do, I don't know, two, three weeks of absolute strength training, then two to three weeks of kind of power uh, training, and then to finish with the absolute speed and agility. Tennis is one sport like this. So uh, tennis is a year round sport with no real off season. Uh, what, I, what I mean about uh, real off season, for me, a real, a real off season is um, at least 10 days to two weeks of uh, complete rest after the, the end of the season. Then somewhere between four and eight weeks of, of uh, physical training only. So without practicing actual sport. In, in, in my sport, in, in tennis, uh, this this kind of off season doesn't exist. So players they do they take some time off, and then uh, uh, when they start to train, they are immediately on the court. So uh, um, I don't have this like I said before four at least four to eight weeks of training where I, where I can concentrate uh, on building capacities. Uh, physical capacity uh, capacities uh, of, of this athlete. I don't have uh, pure time to, to develop this because I need to manage carefully loading because I know that the player it's already on the court and it's already practicing his, his actual sport. Uh, so uh, I found flywheel training as a kind of perfect uh, solution in, in, in this situation because Flywheel training bridges perfectly requirements for strength and speed training based on the load or speed we are using. As you can see on the graph, uh, it's fall, uh, flywheel training falls in this continuum in the, under the strength speed and spin, it speed strength part, depending, uh, like I said, depending on the, on, the, on the load or the speed we are using. So this is another important thing for me uh, why I decide to, to, to start to use five training methodology in my regular training. Uh, ISO inertial training in general is best known for power development. So um, power expression is what makes the difference uh, between players in every sport arena, I think. So uh, if you look uh, best players in the world today from different sports. Uh, let's let's have an example as Ronaldo in football or uh, LeBron James in basketball. Uh, yes, they are highly skilled athletes, but also they are physical monsters. So with high power expression capacities. So uh, also if you if you uh, compare uh, athletes from the first division in every sport with a third or fourth division, for example, or even second division, 
one of the main differences is this power capacity output. So no matter in which way is expressed, this power uh, output as a faster acceleration or a more powerful punch or higher jump, to have higher power output capacity is a huge advantage on the core. So uh, ISO inertial machines allow athletes to train with high power and higher speed. And with it, and with the using this technology, we can closely resemble many functional and athletic movements. So uh, all the time uh, uh, while I'm talking, you can see the video is the same athlete who was doing squat in the in the one of the slides before uh, conventional trap bar squat. If you remember, now he's doing uh, squat uh, uh, on the D11, so-called D11 Desmotech machine, and uh, you can see it's much more faster. Uh, it's and it's. Um, can closely resemble many functional movement which the athlete is using on the court. Uh, so much more than regular type of squat he was doing before. Flywheel training produces high centric muscle stimulation. Uh, so uh, after the power development, this is the second thing which is uh, flywheel training it's known about. So uh, we already know, I think we can all agree about that, that eccentric muscle contraction creates greater force than concentric one. This is nothing, uh, nothing new. Uh, moreover, the eccentric contraction use less energy uh, for the same uh, quantity of the mechanical work compared to the, to the uh, concentric one. Uh, modern training in general, in my opinion, put too much focus on concentric contraction or let's call it production phase. So concentric one, we can call also production phase of the uh, muscle contraction. But important principle is that the more force an athlete can effectively absorb, the more force afterward he can produce. Um, this is one concept really important to understand. And uh, that's why in my training approach, for the purpose of developing explosive and elastic capacities, uh, learning how to effectively uh, absorb forces is something fundamental. So you can see in this graph again, that uh, this, this graph we can call like uh, uh, power and uh, explosiveness uh, um, uh, capacity development capacity. So uh, one of fundamental things are landing mechanics, absorbing control and body awareness. And I always start to, 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 to teach athletes or um, train that before I go to the, uh, like I said before, uh, um, power production phase uh, or concentric part of the, of the, of the muscle contraction continuum. So uh, when you start to use flywheel training uh, machines and when exercising on, on them for already two or three sessions, you learn how to anticipate and control eccentric forces. Uh, so another really important uh, concept behind this training technology is this eccentric muscle contraction. Uh, to back up more this force absorption and uh, force production uh, principle, uh, I will show you some uh, real-time uh, examples, uh, obviously from the world of tennis. So in sport in general, uh, there is continuous uh, alternation between uh, deceleration and acceleration. And we can look at this deceleration as force absorption and acceleration as a force production phase. This is how the skeletal muscles is designed to operate even when we are walk. So if, if you look at these two photos first, so the, the upper photo, on the upper photo, the, the player is actually getting ready to hit the ball. So this is before the shot, so before the contact. And obviously he is sliding to get to the ball because he is defending and uh, you can see the position of the, of the right foot 
which one uh, with the whole leg and the whole system needs to decelerate and to, to stop the body, to stabilize well, to allow athletes to make a, 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 a perfect shot. On the, on the bottom photo, you have uh, situations after, situation after the shot is done. So you can see the ball is leaving. So it's left the racket. But the athletes, uh, athlete is still it's in, in, the, in the, this force absorption phase because he's still sliding after the shot. And now the left leg is doing majority of the work to decelerate and to absorb forces. Um, so like I said, athletes are great at producing power, but not so efficient when they need to absorb forces. Uh, there is a huge advantage uh, if athletes is able to control efficiently these eccentric forces. Um, uh, on the other hand, if you, if you uh, follow statistics and researchers, uh, uh, you can find that majority of muscle pulls or strains is happening during inadequate capacity to absorb high eccentric forces. So uh, again, uh, because uh, uh, in my simple explanation, why is like this? because uh, force absorption, it's not so well developed as a force production. To see in a, really, uh, in, in a real time, so this is when the player are moving. So notice every time before he changed direction, this is, uh, he needs to do this uh, uh, loading phase or uh, uh, force absorption to reaccelerate and to catch the ball. So it's pretty clear. This is one example from the tennis, but uh, you can see this from football, basketball, and almost every sport. So I think this is not questionable about uh, importance of this eccentric, uh, sorry, about this force absorption uh, phase. Uh, to continue uh, about this eccentric story, uh, and uh, uh, eccentric development, uh, it's also uh, one another, uh, another uh, uh, really important uh, principle behind this training technology is so-called eccentric overload or delayed eccentric action. So um, eccentric overload is specific training stimulus related to the flywheel training methodology. After the end of concentric muscle contraction, so what is happening? So after the end of concentric, concentric muscle uh, contraction, so force production phase, as I said before. And during transition in the first 15 degrees, there is almost no resistance. But after that, you get hit with the strong eccentric forces. So uh, when it comes to the joints position and angles, uh, this eccentric punch, let's call it like this, it's happening around angles when you are on the court and when you are ready and when you need to change direction or when you need to do another job. So a number of researchers as well have been carried out on the benefits of the eccentric overload and some of them I put in the reference page and, and, and then uh, you can go through them if, if you want. On this video here now, uh, actually this athlete is doing uh, I, I think third or fourth time uh, on the on the ISO inertial machine. So he's still adjusting himself, learning how to use and uh, uh, this this technology because it's new for him. So, but look at the angles, especially pay attention to the angles when he's changing direction. First, I put him in a more uh, stationary position. Oh, he just needs to do lateral lunge and go back and see the angle when he needs to push off so he absorb and then push off. And then when he starts to move, again, we have the same this angle, which more or less are happening always on the court when he needs to shuffle uh, during the classic uh, tennis uh, point or during the tennis game. Uh, another huge benefit of eyes inertial training is for developing fascial fitness. And now, uh, fascial fitness is something uh, relatively new in the strength and conditioning community. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, nobody talked about fascia. Uh, now, 
uh, there is, um, uh, we know how important it is, especially for a muscle and joint system. Uh, just to put, just to give you one information for me critical, one of the critical is that fascia has 10, now even more uh, time uh, proprioceptors than the muscle system. So this is a huge, hugely important uh, information. So it has 10 times more capacity to send information to, to the uh, center, to our center, uh, central nervous system. Uh, as this one, it's not a, a webinar about uh, fascia and uh, fascial fitness. I will not go too much into the deep of fascial fitness. I just put a few notes here. What is the, the, the best training for fascia? And uh, first of all, it's omnidirectional with submaximal load at the higher speed. Uh, all of this by using whole body movement, if it's possible, by varying forces and directions of load, so-called vector variability. Also, good, good stimulus for fascia training is using counter movement or cre creating pre-stretch of uh, or recoil properties. So all of this, it's making. Um, uh, so all of this uh, perfectly fits uh, to the with the uh, flywheel training machines, and uh, I will show you here a few of the examples how I'm using. So uh, even in, in in more sagittal maybe oriented exercise, sagittal frontal plane, you can see because this is offset loading, so high uh, rotational forces as well. Uh, uh, um, the uh, athlete need to control doing regular split squat uh, and um, uh, needs to be really stable during this kind of of, 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 uh, of exercise. Then on the second video, uh, the middle video, you can see more rotational one because tennis is rotational sport and the exercise that can be done in transverse plane of motion has more transfer into the tennis court itself. So we call this rotational lift. So again, if he's using his whole body because to decelerate, uh, to, uh, to decelerate weight when he's going on the, his right hip, he needs to use whole body to be able to, to not break under the load. And then by pushing off the hip, he's finishing rotation up which is really uh, uh, um, closely resemble the movement on the court. Uh, on the third video, another exercise, uh, uh, which, which one uh, it's uh, closely resembled to the sport itself again. Uh, so classic step up to hit the ball from the closed position where he, uh, you see, we, we, where you can see we have resistance in the in the arms, but also on the in this case on the left leg. So um, uh, uh, athlete need to control forces, uh, uh, which he will find also on the on the court during the, the specific moment. Um, another. Uh, principle of training of fascia, it's so-called tensegrity or building collagen in the, in the, in the fascia system. Uh, I'm using uh, uh, flywheel training uh, also to create this capacity. So fascia training is, is developing internal stability around muscles and joints. So this internal stability is crucial to allow transfer of force and to keep body stable during the change of direction, stopping or, or starting. And uh, on the video, you can see uh, one example of using this principle into the, into the training and I'm calling this positional pulsing. So um, this exercise is putting high demand on the whole body again to keep position, especially core, but uh, uh, whole body as well and uh, to keep he needs to be stable to keep position under constant change three-dimensionally. So uh, really important function of the, of the uh, uh, iso-inertial training methodology is to build this capacity as well. Um, to conclude this short presentation about using flywheel training methodology in, in the world of tennis, uh, I would like to say that flywheel training is a relatively new method 
and uh, it's used to train human body with continuous resistance and eccentric overload. Uh, this type bridges perfectly requirements for strength and speed. So in the situations where you don't have enough time, you don't have long periods of training, for me, it's a perfect solution. Meet all the requirements for the fascia training as well. Uh, there is more and more researchers that verifying advantages of this training method, not only for the strength power, but also for the injury prevention or reduction or, or, or rehabilitation. But um, I did not talk more about uh, this in this presentation simply because I, I personally need more education and more practice about how to use it for the purpose of, purpose of, of rehabilitation. So uh, I hope you found uh, interesting my, my presentation and uh, I, I, I really hope that will encourage you to start implementing this technology uh, in your training and learning about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dalibor. Uh, it has been a very good presentation. So I very appreciated uh, your slide and the contents of your slide. So uh, I would like to uh, ask you a couple of questions. They are very simple in reality, but the, the first one is, what is the perception of your athletes uh, about flywheel training? I guess they are accustomed also to do traditional resistant training, but uh, how they perceive flywheel training? Yeah, a really good question, Marco. Uh, because when I when I implement uh, this this training technology, and this was like uh, four or five years ago when I started to use it, it was a uh, it, it was a big shock for them in 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 a way, you know. Because like like I said during the presentation, we are uh, during the the our let's say conventional type of especially strength training, we are focused on this concentric or force production part and now when you when you when you when you start to use for the first time this technology it's 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 shocking in a way that uh, um, the same force you produce to go up for, from the squat then you need to control it to go down and we are not used to it we are not using the system properly and then uh, they need uh, like like i said before at least three four sessions at least to, to start to uh, adjust uh, movement to the to the to the to the new machine and to the to the new training technology. Thank you, thank you very much. So I have to be honest. Also, in um, a couple of my studies uh, where we were working uh, to understand the reliability. For example, of the power output, uh, we have seen that you need a um, we need some session of familiarization in order to to accustom yeah. to, to to training. So you you confirm obviously this point uh, with the... yeah. Uh, sorry to, to interrupt you. So uh, uh, I'm not a scientist, so I'm I'm practical guy. Uh, uh, but of course, when I when I want to introduce something new into the into my training sessions. I try to find the backup in the researchers, uh, of course. Um, and uh, uh, I, I really, I, I remember my, 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 my start of my journey, it was like uh, reading a lot of studies, whatever I can find on the, on the internet. And uh, um, after I read uh, them all, I said, this sounds too good to be true. Believe me, and uh, and uh, I, I start slowly using uh, with myself first. I wanted to try first how I'm going to react uh, uh, and to understand better how to uh, uh, impose to my athletes. No, no, brilliant. Thank you very much. The second question is also the last that I have is uh, before you were talking about a phase of power development. So how many times a week do you recommend flywheel training with your athletes? Because obviously the frequency will change at the base of the phase, but if we take in consideration this power developing phase or cycle, what, uh, what do you suggest? Yeah, so the, the, the answer is it depends. It's not that I'm hiding behind the answer, but it depends because uh, it's depending on, on the phase we are right now, how much time we have ahead of us, uh, in which uh, part of the season we are, uh, in, 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 in what is the actual physical state of the athletes and so on, uh, how much he needs this kind of training and so on. 
So, like I said before, uh, in the tennis, uh, with no real off season, when we have periods of two, three weeks of of of, uh, of uh, like preparation periods, or between tournaments, or when we are changing the the surface uh, part of the season, so um, usually I'm using two times a week, not more, because with with the more uh, with more training, I, I found out that I create a little bit too much fatigue because, like I said, tennis players are, are, are always on the court. So uh, professional ones, never below two hours uh, a day. So with that kind of loading, specific loading on the court, I, I need to manage uh, uh, really carefully loading outside the court. Perfect. No, thank you very much for your answer. I think uh, it's been also very honest because I, I agree with you. So depend of uh, the, the period of the season, I also get the level of the athletes, the experience. So uh, brilliant. Uh, so I, I thank you very much for your presentation. I hope obviously your presentation will be very useful also for uh, the people that are watching us and all the practitioners that will listen, uh, obviously, your presentation. Thank you, Marco, uh, for the kind words. I hope as well it will be useful and thank you all for, for your time.